Hey Jody here. Today I'm TIG welding carbon steel outside corner joints, lap joints, and key joints. This is a little training exercise and incorporates all three joints. It's a great one for students because a lot more can go wrong than just sticking two pieces of metal together. So we're going to talk a little bit about oxidation, talk a little bit about using chill bars to prevent oxidation, and whatever else comes along. Let's do it. With just a little bit of metal we're going to do outside corner joints, lap joints, as well as joints and the thing about it is it's going to get really hot really quick so we're going to talk about using backing for chill bars too some of this is cold rolled some of it's hot rolled I'm cleaning it all with a flap disc giving it a wipe down with acetone before I get started I'm going to wipe the filler rods too for the sake of time I didn't film the tack welds but a good rule of thumb on tack welds Try to make them smaller than the final weld so that you can go over them and not see where the tacks were. On a drawing, the weld symbols would look something like this. All fillet welds. I'm using a CK MT200 machine with a foot pedal. Here are the basic settings that I used. 100 to 125 amps. A number 8 clear furic cup with 20 CFH. 332 2% lanthanated electrode and a 1 16th ER70S6 filler. So I'm using aluminum backing and also this little block that I've made in a previous video to kind of prop my hand on. It comes in really handy for uh, lots of things like this. So first up is the outside corner joint. And again, I'm, I'm set with the machine set on a 125 max, but I'm not quite full pedal for most of the time. That changes with the chill bar. You, you add chill bar like that, you're going to need a little bit more amperage, but it sure does help in pulling the heat out and keeping discoloration to a minimum and distortion to a minimum. Let's take another quick look at that arc shot and talk about the, the hot tip of that rod. You can see how I'm not coming very far out of the puddle. I'm keeping the hot tip of that rod shielded with the argon envelope coming out of that number eight cup. That's important. You can get away with it here and there coming in and out of the argon. You'll notice a difference when you introduce that rod back into the puddle. But you don't want it. You don't want to make a habit out of it. You want to keep the hot tip of that rod shielded, keep those oxides out of the puddle. Otherwise, the puddle swims around, and it's kind of unruly. We're tapering off here. I'm taking two to three seconds to taper off, backing up a little bit as I do. And I'm going to hold the post flow over there and let it time out. All right. Up next is the lap joint. Now, depending on requirements, you might want to not go all the way up to the shoulder or the edge with the weld. I kind of like to up to about eighth inch thickness like this. I like to take the puddle all the way to that edge, put a full fillet weld on there. But there are definitely times when you wouldn't want to put a weld that, that big on something like this, and you might want to drop down to a smaller wire. This is a 1 16th, 1.6 millimeter wire. And you would drop down to a 045, probably would work better if you didn't want that big of a weld on there. Lots of different requirements for different applications out there. Once again, I'm backing up a little bit as I taper off. And that's the lap weld. Now the chill bar is going a long way in keeping this thing from overheating. I didn't let this thing cool a whole lot between these two welds. And that aluminum bar is soaking up a lot of heat. In fact, I burnt my hand on it when I was removing it to, to cool it off. So last is the T-joint. If you didn't have chill bars, you definitely want to give it a few minutes and let it cool off a bit. So I'm not doing anything tremendously different than I did on the lap joint, except that I'm just trying to eyeball and keep the weld the same size. I don't have that edge to guide me. I'm trying to make sure to flow that puddle all the way down into the corner. That's also called the root of the joint. And the goal on a fillet weld like this and this thickness is to penetrate into, fully penetrate into the root of the joint, but not much more than that. And you don't want to penetrate all the way through to the back side. Okay, well that's all three welds. Let's talk about some mistakes that we can make. I'd like to say I did this on purpose, but I was just wasn't thinking and I did the wrong sequence and welded the T-joint before the lap joint and look what happened there. If I'd had enough tack welds on it, it might have been okay, but there was no tack in the middle there. It got so hot, it bowed way up, and really the only thing to do was just cut it loose and tack a new piece on there. 
Now, I could have possibly salvaged it by heating it up and C-clamping it and all kinds of things like that, but it wasn't worth it. That's a, quite a bow right there. All right, so again, put some small fusion tacks on here, some, something smaller than the final weld will be. And then a little bit of filler rod on the ends of that T-joint. And this time I'm going to tack in the middle on both sides. And then I'll, I can weld that that T-joint first by doing that without it bowing up. Now let's talk now about what happens when you need to weld both sides of 11 gauge metal. It gets really hot on the back side and actually scales up unless you do something to prevent that. And to prevent it I'm going to use aluminum backing. Now I save pieces of aluminum like this. I have all kinds of different pieces that come in super handy for outside corners, for clamping down sheet metal projects keeping them from warping and I'm, I've got a big block clamped to the back side of this T-joint here and I'm going to show the difference in welding the back side after having welded the other side using backing versus not what it welds like when it's all scaled up versus when you use backing. Before I do that though I'm going to switch over to a ceramic 12 cup and I'm going to show you how that works a little bit. I've been using a, a clear number 8 Furic Pro for the, for the first part of this video. I'm going to switch over to the ceramic 12 same gas flow. This is a standard 17 style air cooled torch. This is what comes with most TIG welders, at least 200 amp and under TIG welders. In order to use the Furic cups, I've got to remove that stuff, pop the insulator off, and use the insulator that comes with an adapter kit. Here is the collet body that comes with the adapter kit and a wedge collet that also comes with it. This lets me upgrade to any of the Furic cups. These are number eight pros here. They come four to a box. And this little guide here that shows you kind of which torch you need the adapter kit with. I moisten the O-ring and I slip the 8 Pro cup on there, chuck up my electrode, and I'm ready to go. Okay, now in, to, switch, to switch from this to the Ceramic 12, I'm just going to pull the O-rings off of this because it is threaded. And the Ceramic 12 is threaded. I put the Ceramic 12 on and I'm ready to go with that one. But that's not the only way. That also, it also, this cup also works with the uh, stubby hardware that I sell. This is a 332 setup here. Screws right on there. That works. This is another one of the lap joints. This time done with the Furic Ceramic 12. And you can see I've got quite an electrode extension going there. And that's mainly for ease of filming. It gets the cup out of the way so you can see everything that's going on. Again, I'm taking the puddle right up to the edge trying to keep a straight edge there. It gives me a little bit more forgiveness on shielding the hot tip of that wire too because I've got such a larger argon envelope here. Now this is carbon steel. You don't have really discoloration issues so much like it doesn't really affect the quality of the weld. But if this were stainless, I think you could imagine how much better it would be going here with this number 12 than other cups. And I didn't, I didn't even increase the argon flow. I'm, I'm running 20 CFH here of argon. And you can see I've got a rather large argon shield there. I've got a, a large area with, that's free from any discoloration at all. So for certain alloys, that is super important. So we're going to talk now about what happens when you have to weld the back side of an area that you've already welded the other side of. You want the puddle to flow like this, but when you weld one side and then you go to weld the second side, it usually welds like this. That's horrible. All that oxidation, all that scaling, you just really can't even define the puddle hardly. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a, a slitting wheel and um, just shave it. Just try to shave the oxide film off of there and see if it'll weld better by doing that. I'm putting very light pressure here. I don't want to put big dig, big grinding marks in here. But just laying the, the, the slitting wheel on its edge, it cleans it up quite a bit. It's not perfect, but it's going a lot better than it was prior to cleaning it up. It goes a lot better if you just put if you just put aluminum backing on the back side. It pulls out enough heat and traps a little argon in there, where it welds almost as good as the front side. All right, we'll do one little one more lap joint here using that the ceramic 12, showing the filler rod hand here for a minute. Sometimes I wear a different glove on my filler rod hand if I feel like I'm not able to feel the rod well enough. Now that cup did a great job right there. I backed off the heat just a little, and so the last four inches or so hardly discolored at all. Now this is the eight cup from a previous video doing lap joints. 
I think you can see how it just kind of illuminates the whole path. You know, it helps me see where I'm going these days. My eyes aren't what they used to be. It's, it's also good for aluminum. You can see me looking through the cup right there. That's also another, another benefit of this cup. I test out products before I put them on my store. I want to make sure it's something I would buy. So this is a 200 amp weld using a feature called Advanced Pulse. And man, it held up just fine. Did a great job. It's a good all-around cup that really helps light the way and it helps you see where you're going. You can get this on my store as a four pack. You can also get it as bundled with a TIG finger for a savings between buying the two. And you will need the adapter kit if you have a 17, 18, or 26 style torch. If you've got a 9 or 20 style torch, you can just slip the O-ring on your collet body, your gas lens collet body, and it'll work just fine. This is a ceramic 12 on a shot on a video I did a while back using a lay wire technique on preheated 4140. And you can see the job it did there as far as the shielding. Awesome cup that doesn't require much more gas than, a, like say, a number 8 style cup because of the added diffuser right there. It's a double diffuser, and it's, it's a design that's been tested and proven, and it works great. You can also get it bundled with a TIG finger for a savings. And you will also need either the adapter kit like this to make it work. Just pull the O-rings off and thread it on, or it works with the basic stubby gas lens kit with the um, regular stubby hardware and you get a few extra little goodies there. So hey, thanks for watching. If you like this sort of thing, hit the subscribe button. I'd appreciate if you'd visit my store at weldmonger.com. We'll see you next time.